Jumping forward in time to the early 20th century, we can really see how sustained contact between indigenous and European cultures resulted in the continued development of Mesoamerican artistic traditions. Political upheavals to the point of violent revolutions took place around the world in the decades surrounding World War I and II. Um, in Mexico, the Mexican Revolution of about 1910 to 1920, led by peasants and workers, ultimately toppled the autocratic dictatorship of General Porfirio Diaz, and after a series of unstable regimes, finally established a constitutional republic. Democratic reforms transformed the country by allowing communal land ownership and providing universal public education and health care. Art thrived over the next few decades in reaction to this changing political environment, and new government leaders engaged artists in the service of the people and state. Mexican modernists adapted aspects of European modernism while simultaneously promoting awareness of Mexicanidad or Mexican identity by mixing references to pre-conquest, colonial, and modern Mexican culture into their artworks. So during and after the Mexican Revolution, public art served as a powerful tool to declare and celebrate Mexican national identity. Several Mexican artists received government commissions to decorate public buildings with murals celebrating the history, life, and work of the Mexican people. The roots of muralism in Mexico stretch back to ancient Mesoamerica, where buildings were adorned with monumental artworks. This tradition continued into the colonial era with paintings on church walls and ceilings, and in the 1920s, the Mexican government sponsored the mural movement to justify the revolution and promote the current regime. By the 1930s, mural commissions had expanded to the United States, where murals were painted in post offices and other public buildings. The Mexican muralist movement ultimately developed from these governmental commissions, and the artists involved often aimed to make art democratically accessible to people of all social classes. The themes of their murals often included events from the Mexican Revolution, as well as pre colonial Aztec. Um, culture, indigenous heroes from Mexican history, and scenes of everyday life among the common people. Diego Rivera was one of the most prominent Mexican muralists. He studied art in Mexico City before spending about 14 years in Europe studying Renaissance frescoes and modern art. A dedicated Marxist and member of the Communist Party, Rivera was committed to muralism as a form of social and political engagement. His mural, titled The History of Mexico, commissioned by the Mexican government, is a buon fresco, or um, wet fresco, located in the National Palace in Mexico City. It covers the high walls around a grand staircase and is composed of crowded figures um, in scenes ranging from ancient times to the post-revolution period. Rivera's style features simplified figures, heavy outlines, and bold colors. The pre-conquest scenes in the mural depict Aztecs as tranquil farmers and artisans. Later scenes show violent conflicts and rebellions against Spanish conquerors, European colonial powers, and national dictators. For instance, the lower part of the central section portrays Aztec warriors trying to fend off armed Spanish cavalry. The cycle concludes with images from post-revolutionary Mexico, illustrating present-day life and expressing hope for industrial progress and socialist success in the future. Other artists in Mexico were more subtly political than muralists, but they still reflect both a nationalistic commitment to Mexican heritage as well as European influence. Um, so in this time, many European artists, including surrealists Lenora Carrington, Salvador Dali, and André Breton, fled Europe before and during World War II, um, and many of them landed in North and South America, where they influenced local artists and emerging movements. Surrealism became a popular international visual language, spreading through all forms of visual culture, and it found a particularly strong foothold in Mexico. 
Mexican artist Frida Kahlo has often been labeled as a surrealist, even by André Breton himself, and this is typically due to her often psychologically unsettling imagery. However, Kahlo did not affiliate herself with the surrealist movement, stating only that she painted her own reality rather than the dreams or the unconscious. In spite of this, the surrealist influence is hard to deny. However, where European surrealists were fascinated with aspects of indigenous cultures that they considered primitive, Mexican artists like Caló were interested in both modern and traditional Mexican life. Caló's works, many of which are self-portraits, combine naturalistic depictions of her appearance with graphic metaphorical imagery resulting in powerful explorations of her own personal biography, her medical conditions, her mixed cultural heritage, and the repression of women. Born in 1907, Caló suffered lifelong chronic illness and pain. She may have been born with spina bifida, a medical condition affecting the development of the spinal column, but at age six, she suffered from polio, which permanently damaged her right leg and caused lifelong pain and weakness. At the age of 18, she was involved in a bus accident in which her right leg and foot were crushed, her ribs, collarbone, and spine were broken, and her abdomen and uterus were pierced with an iron handrail. After as many as 35 surgeries and an initial three-month recovery period, she experienced severe lifelong pain and underwent several additional operations. Periodically, she had to wear a plaster corset to help heal her spine, and she was often confined to her bed. Her persistent medical issues and the accident impacted her fertility, resulting in multiple miscarriages as well. During her initial recovery, her father brought her art supplies and she began painting for the first time. She had a special easel installed that allowed her to paint while in bed and a mirror hung above it, which allowed her to see herself. Painting proved to be an effective outlet for representing her experiences with these physical, mental, and emotional traumas. Her artworks tend to combine relatively naturalistic depictions of her outward appearance and often more graphic depictions of her chronic physical and psychological suffering with metaphorical references to her feelings, personal experiences, relationships, again, her mixed cultural heritage, her own personal philosophy and sense of identity, as well as ideas of feminism and womanhood. Um, as I mentioned, many of her works are self-portraits, and she once said, quote, I paint myself because I am so often alone and because I am the subject that I know best. In 1929, at the age of 22, Frida Kahlo married the 42-year-old Mexican muralist Diego Rivera. Kahlo painted this work in 1932, titled Self-Portrait Between the Borderline of Mexico and the United States, shortly after returning from traveling the United States with Rivera from 1930 and 31, during which time she experienced her second miscarriage. So within this composition, she positions herself atop a stone that straddles the border between Mexico and the United States with an inscription that reads, Carmen Rivera painted her portrait 1932. So she's used her Christian name, Carmen, and her husband's surname, Rivera. She's shown herself holding a Mexican flag made out of papel picado, which is a traditional Mexican art form using cut paper. Um, and then in the other hand, she's holding a cigarette. To the left, we see a Mexican landscape with native plants and cacti in bloom firmly rooted in the soil. The pre-Columbian figures and temple reference ancient Mesoamerican heritage, but the temple is damaged, maybe alluding to cultural deterioration or more specifically to earthquakes that damaged a lot of Mexico's ancient architecture during the same year that this was painted. She also includes a skull that can be interpreted as both a symbol of Mexican heritage because of its association with um, Dia de los Muertos motifs and festivals, but also it's sort of a memento mori or reminder of the violence committed against Native people by European colonial powers. The right side of the composition depicts the American landscape of industry crowded with skyscrapers and machines, all plant life has been replaced by wires and cables, and in the distance, we see the smokestacks of a Ford automobile factory emitting a cloud of smog that supports an American flag. 
Beneath the border, the black ribbons of the electrical cords meet and intertwine with the natural roots of the Mexican vegetables and plants. Perhaps Kahlo is suggesting that in excuse me, that American industrialism, which her husband sort of celebrated in many of his murals, is infecting the rich Mexican soils, or maybe that the U.S. relies on Mexican labor, Mexican fertility for its own material progress. Um, in personal correspondence, Kahlo claimed that she painted this to express her own feelings of homesickness and isolation that had plagued her during her travels with Rivera. Here we have another um, self-portrait by Colo. This is a large-scale double self-portrait from 1939 titled Two Fridas, um, and it presents two versions of the artist, identical except for their outfits. Um, they're seated on a bench framed against this sort of ominous stormy sky. The figures join hands and gaze stoically out at the viewer. The use of a double self-portrait here is interesting, and it could have several metaphorical interpretations. Perhaps the most overt connection is to the mirror that she had installed over her bed, which allowed her to paint herself during recovery and bouts of illness. The double portrait also calls attention to her complex cultural identity as a woman of mixed Mexican and German Jewish heritage. Prior to her marriage to Rivera, Kahlo typically wore modern European fashions of the era, but Rivera really encouraged her to embrace her Mexican heritage, and so she adopted more traditional Mexican attire. The use of two figures here allows her to address these two distinct aspects of her identity. Um, the Frida on the left wears a contemporary European gown, sort of reflecting her father's German roots and the styles that she wore in her earlier life. And the Frida on the right wears more traditional Mexican attire, a skirt and a blouse, reflecting her mother's heritage and the styles that she embraced after her marriage to Rivera. As in many of her works, human anatomy is graphically depicted here with the hearts of the two figures vulnerably exposed and the one on the left is further ripped open. This emphasizes the sensitive emotional content of the painting and it also references the ancient Aztec custom of human sacrifice by removing the heart. Kahlo often used blood as a sort of visceral metaphor of union. The two figures here are not only holding hands, but they are also further connected by a common artery that stretches between their two hearts. Perhaps this represents the literal mixing of Mexican and European bloodlines within her veins, or perhaps it symbolizes a newfound unity between the two halves of her cultural identity. I think it's also significant to note that the year she painted this canvas was the same year that Kahlo divorced Rivera. She allegedly once told an art historian that the Mexican Frida in this portrait was the Frida whom Diego Rivera had loved, and the European Frida was the one that he did not. The exposed hearts and arteries are indicative of her feelings of sadness and vulnerability at the time. On the right, notice the artery wrapping around um, the traditional Mexican Frida's arm feeds into a miniature portrait of Diego Rivera, indicating that part of her still pines for her lost love. On the left, the more modern Frida clamps down on the vein with a hemostat, figuratively severing her connection to Rivera and literally stopping the bleeding. She has been hurt, and that cannot be undone, as evidenced by the bright red blood that stains her white dress, um, sort of marring the symbolic innocence of the white color. However, she is still strong and still resilient. Here's one more example of Frida Kahlo's work. This is titled The Broken Column from 1944, and it's probably one of her most powerful and emotionally charged works. This serves as a clear metaphor for the physical and emotional pain that she experienced throughout her life, as well as a testament to her strength and resiliency. The central figure in the painting fills the majority of the composition with a stoic facial expression and emphasized dark monobrow conveying her suffering. Tears spill onto her cheeks, further highlighting her anguish. The lower body of the figure is covered with a flowing white sheet while the torso remains nude. Nails pierce her skin and her body is cracked open, revealing that her spinal column has been replaced with a crumbling Greek ionic column, 
which is often considered to be the feminine architectural order. This column, though ancient and ideal, is no longer effective in supporting her body. It symbolizes the continuous physical pain that she endured, specifically her back pain and the repeated spinal surgeries that she underwent. Callot's body, like the column, is broken and held together with bandages, braces, and sheer willpower. Her rigid upright posture, combined with her controlled expression, conveys the idea that she is a strong and resolute woman, acknowledging her pain, vulnerability, and fragility. Callot's artworks, including this one, are also deeply political and feminist. This painting comments on how women's bodies and emotions were often considered secondary to the nation's needs at the time. Her nudity and the vulnerability that it represents show the sacrifice and strength of women. At the time the broken column was created, Mexico was experiencing a growing sense of nationalism and anti-colonial sentiments. Many have interpreted this painting as not only a metaphor for her own physical and emotional pain, but also as a symbol of the crumbling of Mexico's past and a desire to rebuild a stronger and more unified nation.